Welcome to the first virtual event with The Source by Bank Plus. The Source was created to educate and connect and empower working women. And while we never anticipated a global pandemic to thwart our networking opportunities, The Source has always tried to provide our members on-demand content. We want to meet you where and when you are and connect you with industry experts like we have here today. With more than 21 years on the speaking circuit, Mississippi's first certified speaking professional, Mandy Stanley, has been speaking to working women and professionals all over the world and all in high heels. Her clients include Campbell Soup, the U.S. Air Force, the NFL, Godiva Chocolate, and The Source. Welcome, Mandy. Thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Mary Stratton. I'm excited about our discussion today. Now, we all know about grammar. We can think back on grammar classes as kids, and we all use grammar all day, every day in speaking and writing. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is grammar can, incorrect grammar rather, can also give you away. So when you use correct grammar in your speaking and your writing, it projects an air of confidence, an air of thoughtfulness, and an air of intention as well. So can you tell us quickly about why you thought this topic was important for the source to cover? And that's an excellent point because we're not going to spend 20 minutes right now talking about grammar and punctuation and spelling for the sake of grammar and punctuation and spelling. Rather, this topic is important because first, communication is a crucial element in leadership skills. And also because I believe the quality of our written communication is indeed a direct reflection of the quality of the work we do. So for instance, today, Email is the number one most widely used communication tool in the workplace. It has surpassed Zoom and other virtual platforms and even our cell phones for follow-up required communication. So you and I are filming this at a time when many people are working remotely. So email has become our number one most widely used communication tool from office to office, from home to home. And while it's number one, it's also number one most misused, overused, and even abused communication tool because sometimes we don't pay as much attention to our writing and sentence structure as we should. So if you're noticing sloppily written or hastily written emails because people think, oh, it's just a quick email, it really doesn't matter. Right. Well, it can make us look bad. It can make the work group we represent work bad. It can make an entire organization look bad. So the quality of our writing does directly reflect the quality of our work and no pressure representing your entire company by one or two important emails. So we, um, prior to this recording, came up with some, some questions. You sent them to me ahead of time, and I'd like to jump into the first question if Great. I can. So are I you can. ready for a pop quiz? I'm ready, I cannot wait. Grammar is, uh, I'm a grammar snob and I, I love it. Um, first of all, if you have any questions, please give Mary Stratton or I, me, or myself a call. Great. I tried to come up with not basic grammar questions, but what we are sharing and what we did with Instagram Live, these are the questions I'm asked most often in my live seminars. And I, me, myself is number one. People always question, is it I, is it me, or myself? Or they believe they know which one it is and it's not necessarily the case. So in this case, what did the poll show us the results were? 10% of our answers were I, 67% were me, 23% said myself. And the correct answer is me. Give Mary Stratton or me a call. So quick way to understand how to catch this every single time. The grammar rules tell us that I is a nominative case pronoun. So which that means it's gonna be focused and working as the subject of the sentence or the predicate nominative of a sentence. Don't worry about that. Me is an objective case pronoun, so it's going to be the object of the verb or the object of a preposition. One rule about the word myself. Avoid it. Avoid myself because myself is reflexive. And no one can do something to yourself. Only you can do it to yourself. I cannot give something to themselves. I can give it to them, but I can't give it to themselves. 
You know, I can't give something to yourselves. I can give it to you or I can give it to y'all. And not that this is grammar, but we do know the plural of y'all. All y'all, all all y'all, yeah, everyone needs to know that today from the source, all y'all. But in this case, avoid myself. There's a hack, so to speak, for knowing if I, me, or myself is the correct answer. So if you're questioning, is it I, or is it me, or is it myself, use the one finger trick. Cover up the first part of that compound. In this case, we're covering up Mary Stratton or. And you read the sentence without it. So if I read, if you have any questions, please give I a call. You know that's not correct. Please give me a call. You know that is correct. So it would be give Mary Stratton or me a call. We don't have to worry about if it's nominative or if it's subjective. Cover up it with your finger, and that's how you can proofread it every single time. What a great hint. And because that one is such a big question people have, we do have another I, me, myself. So why don't we try this one and see what people come yes. up with. Yes. Is this the new job description for Kylan and I, me, or myself? So based on what we just talked about, we're going to cover up Kylan and, and the correct answer is me. Is it for Kylan and me? And How about did we two, do with the About two-thirds of our answers got that correct. Good. Okay. So that, they know the one finger That's right. Thing. That's Great. right. Uh, the third question, I don't know who or whom in the Tupelo office should we call about this? What were the answers? 82% said who, 18% said whom. Okay, here's a drum roll. The correct answer is whom. So how many answered whom? 18%. 18% nailed it. But what about the others? Let's talk about how we, again, can use a quick grammar hack to know the answer to that one. It's an auditory trick. So if you're ever questioning, is it who or is it whom, pull out the questionable word. And if you can fill in the blank with he or she, then who is the word you should use. Likewise, if you're uncertain, pull out the questionable word. And if you can fill in the blank with him or her, then whom is the word you can use. Match up the M's. If him works in the sentence, then whom is the correct answer. So in our sentence on the screen, let's try this. Would we say we should call he in the Tupelo office or we should call him? And because we would say we should call him, whom is indeed the correct answer. That is perfect. What a great way to remember that. Okay, number four, Bill will try to or try and get in touch with his clients before the end of the week. So we hear a lot of people say try and. I'll try and get there by seven o'clock. I'll try and take care of this before tomorrow. The only grammar hack for this answer is that we never, 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 never say try and. Try and is incorrect grammar. It's always try to do something. So Bill will try to get in touch with his clients. Never try and. And of course, as Yoda says, there is no try. There, there is, is no only to <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the instances in which you should just forget something altogether. That is, that is, that's a very safe space for but me. But now that you know that, you're going to start hearing it so much. Right. People say it a lot. And right. it's not a regional uh, grammar speaking tendency. I hear that anywhere I go. People say try and incorrectly. It sounds very Southern, but I'm glad to hear that it's not just us. Number five, the mandate to work remotely during the coronavirus pandemic greatly affected or effected the scheduling of our seminars with the source. Besides I, me, and myself, affect and effect, that is the most confusing word pair. Now, they're both pronounced effect. For, for the sake of our conversation, we're going to overpronounce affect and effect. And Mary Stratton, I wish there were some good gimmick for this one, but there's not. And that's why people get it confused. So what you do is word replacement. Effect is a noun. And if you're ever questioning, is that the correct word, pull it out and replace it with the re word result. So anytime you want to use effect, use result. And if result works, then effect is the correct answer. So a sentence might be, the flood water, the result of the, or the effect of the flood waters was late crops in the Mississippi Delta. So in this case, I would say the result of, so I know it is indeed effect. Affect is a verb. And when you're using affect in a sentence, it's going to mean to change or to influence. So I always replace it with the word influence. So Hurricane Katrina 
affected the farmer's planting season. Hurricane Katrina influenced the farmer's planting season adversely. So in that case, it's affected because it means to change or to influence. Now, you would think, okay, that's simple enough. Effects a noun, affects a verb. What's so difficult about that? Well, here's the wrench. Effect also can be a verb. And when we use effect as a verb, it means to cause. So that's where we get the cause and effect. Uh, an example of that in a sentence would be, this new human resources policy will effect a change in our overall organization. So the translation might be, this new human resources policy was going to cause a change in our organization. And that's where it gets confusing. So word replacement is the key. That's Result for effect, influence for effect, and then if you think effect's being used as a verb, replace it with cause, and that's how you know it's the correct answer. I will tell you, I have a little mind trick that I use for affect and effect. And a friend's mom taught me this years and years ago, but she said, always think of the AV club at school. Affect is a verb, AV club. So that's what I always use. That's how I use it. That is excellent. Except now the effects of verb. I know you. That's gonna mess it up. You totally, <laughs> <laughs> that was that was my that was my go-to. But now I know that I've got and to I've got to think remember, twice about it. We remember those that we learned in the fifth grade, don't we? Right. We remember those that we hear from a friend's mom or a teacher. And those stick with us even as adults. Right. Right. Number six, Gabe was aggravated or irritated by the news that universities plan to go virtual with classes next spring. Oh goodness, aren't we all? So let's talk about this one because aggravate and irritate are not synonyms. They cannot be used interchangeably. Even though people do. Even though people do, even though the dictionary may tend to say that is acceptable now. In this case, aggravate means to worsen, but you know, I have two teenage sons, and one will come to me and say, Mom, Rhett's aggravating me right now. And that's not correct, because what you're saying is he's worsening me right now. So annoy, if you're getting annoyed, that's when you're being irritated. So he was irritated to hear that news. He wasn't worsened to hear that news. I'm sure your teenage sons love that little correct, that little correct man in there. I love that. <laughs> um, number seven. Katie plans to wear a mask irregardless or regardless of the availability of the vaccine. What were the responses? 4% said irregardless and 96% said regardless. Those 96% know it. Never, 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 never use irregardless. Irregardless is not a word even though it has shown up in the dictionary for about 20 years now. We mean regardless. So if you just decide, don't say irregardless, say regardless, because even though some dictionaries may say it's acceptable, there are people out there who will hear you say irregardless and think that's incorrect grammar. Stick with regardless. Even as I was typing up these questions, the red squiggly line appeared under irregardless. So that, that was a, a big red flag. Good. Number eight, following a, a honeymoon in the Bahamas, the couple plan or plans to make their home in Ridgeland. I hear this one a lot, so I'm interested Listen, to see the ex explanation here. Even the society pages get this incorrect. Couple, maybe two people, it's one collective noun. So you're always going to use a singular verb with it. The couple plans to, to make their home in Ridgeland, not plan. So again, maybe two people, but it's one collective noun, so we use a singular verb with it. Uh, and you'll read it in the newspaper, and it's not always correct, but it's not the couple plan, it's the couple plans to. So does that also apply to family and team? Words such as group, committee, staff, all these words that you would use in the workplace, if it's functioning as one unit, you may have 12 people, but you're still going to use the singular verb with it. I'm very glad to hear that because that's how I say it and write it, so I'm glad to know that I'm right. <laughs> Number nine, and this one, this one hurt me very deeply just because of I'm an 80s and 90s kid. Honey, I shrank or shrunk the kids. Okay, I did this one just for fun. Good. <laughs> because I can remember, I think I was in high school when this movie came out. Mary Stratton, I think that movie, it's the movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids with Rick Moranis. 
I think it came out 30 something years ago. I felt so old using that movie reference and there are probably people in my audiences now who've never even heard of that movie. But I can remember the day it came out, I thought, that is incorrect grammar. It is shrink, shrank, shrunk. It's not, honey, I shrunk the kids. It's, honey, I shrank the kids. So that drives me nuts. If they wanted to use correct grammar, they would have said, honey, I have shrunk the kids. <laughs> but it should have been this entire time, honey, I shrank the kids. Well, I will say that only 32% of our um, participants got that right. So I'm sure they did shrink, shrink, shrunk in their mind there before they go. answered the question. There you go. And I'm, I'm certain that familiarity played a role in that as well. Uh, number 10, our last question. How many commas belong in this sentence? Bank Plus has offices in Jackson, Madison, Tupelo, Hernando, and South Haven. Right. And if people are trying to count commas right now, why don't you tell them that they'll still have access to this quiz if they want to take it? Absolutely. It's saved in our Instagram highlights. So you can take this quiz prior to watching this, or if you want to, to cheat, you can take it afterwards. <laughs> okay, okay, so we'll talk about this one because besides I, me, and myself, and besides affect and effect, this is the comma trauma that comes up in every single grammar for grown-ups class I teach for the past 20 years. It's, there's, the, first of all, there's a name for the comma. It's called the Oxford comma or the serial comma. And it's the one question I'm asked more than any other. People are always saying, should you or should you not use that comma between the next to last and last item in the series, either separated by the word or or the word and or whatever the case may be. And so many people have been taught so many different rules for it that I've put together some special slides for us to illustrate this. So here's the sentence enlarged on the screen. And I usually will ask people, how many of you would put three commas in that sentence? And so that's what's on the screen now. We have comma after Jackson, comma after Madison, and comma after Jubilee. Half of the people will raise their hands and say, yes, that is correct. The remaining half will say, you need to put that comma after Hernando. So what in the world? We're usually half and half. Well, I'm going to sit here right now and tell you for once and for all the rule for this, how you punctuate with the serial comma so that people watching this can go back to work and tell everyone where to stick that comma, okay? <laughs> because as far as today's current grammar guidelines and punctuation guidelines as they direct us, it's optional. But I can't just stop and leave it at that. So if you're one of the people who say, no, I don't put a comma between the next to the last and last item because I was taught and takes the place of the comma, fine, but never use the serial comma for the rest of your life. Likewise, if you're one of the people who does use that comma between Hernando and South Haven in this sentence, then when you finish watching this or participating, use it for the rest of your writing life because what's considered grammatically incorrect and downright wrong is inconsistent use of the serial comma. And Mary Stratton, nobody knows this better than I do because I lost a job because of that comma. I had just graduated from Mississippi State and moved to Dallas. And I was, this is back before you posted job listings online. And so I was looking at the Sunday edition of the Dallas Morning News. And there was an ad for a very well-known company in Dallas advertised. And I looked at it and thought, okay, I'm going to apply for this job. So I put together my cover letter and my resume, beautiful linen paper as we did back in the day, and I mailed it to the address in the ad. And I received a call two days later from the person who had received my resume. And this is what she said. She said, well, Mandy, we've received your resume in response to the ad we ran in the Dallas Morning News. And your qualifications for this entry level job are really very good, but we are not going to invite you in to interview for it. And of course, I'm fresh out of college. I have about this much self-confidence. And so I, she said, but rather than send you a basic rejection letter, and now I'm feeling about this big, she said, I wanted to give you the courtesy of calling you to let you know on your cover letter where you listed items in a series you used a serial comma. She said, but on your resume where you had items in a series, you did not use a serial comma. And this is what she said, I remember this. She said, that indicated to her that I would probably be a rather inconsistent employee in her department. Yeah, no, we have names for people like that, don't we? Yeah. But you better believe from that moment on, I always paid attention to that comma. And I am one of the people who, yes, I use the serial comma because I'm always going to be correct. If I do, I sometimes could be confusing 
if I don't. Let's look at this sentence. This one reads, Mr. Stanley divided his estate equally among Ashley, Michelle, Mel, and Carrie. So how many people would put the comma after Ashley and the comma after Michelle? Or how many would add that serial comma after Mel? In this case, Mel and Carrie desperately need us to use this comma <laughs> because what a lot of people don't know is this is an actual case that went to court. I believe it was back in Illinois in the 1940s. And the attorney who took this case to court based the entire argument on the omission of the serial comma in the will, saying that according to the way the will is drafted, if we don't use that serial comma, which Mr. Stanley obviously didn't do, Ashley gets a third of the estate. Michelle gets one third of the estate. Mel and Carrie, in this case, are punctuated as one entity. So they get the remaining third of the estate, each of them, I guess, having to get 16.5%. And I think most people, when they read that, they think in their heart of hearts that Mr. Stanley intended his four nieces to get the estate with Ashley 25%, Michelle 25%, Mel 25%, and Carrie 25%. So in a case like this, by using that serial comma, we are clearly indicating to the reader that we are talking about four separate and distinct parties. So yes, it's important to be consistent, but as proofreaders, we want to make doubly sure we're not sending an ambiguous message to our readers. So pick a side. Yes. <laughs> and stick with it. And most of the up-to-date writing style guides will tell you, go ahead and use the serial comma. The only one that doesn't is the Associated Press style guide because their style is not to use the Oxford comma or the serial comma. But in other cases, when in doubt, definitely stick it in. So just out of curiosity, how did we get here where we have to make the decision between using the Oxford comma or not using the Oxford, Oxford comma? At what point did it become an argument? People are taught different rules. Some people will tell me, and I ask that question in my classes. Some people will say, well, I was taught, my teacher told me the and takes the place of the comma. So I've never used it. Some people will tell me they were taught that if it's adjectives in a series, you don't use a serial comma, but if it's nouns in a series, you do. There's so many different rules floating around out there. And that's why most of the grammar books you look at now, and the ones I refer to the most are the Greg Reference Manual, and my favorite for workplace writing is the Franklin Covey Style Guide for Business and Technical Communication. They err on the side of using the serial comma for the sake of clarity. That is so interesting. And when we posted these questions on Instagram, we actually received a direct message from one of our participants and said that she was so glad to know the source's stance on the Oxford comma. <laughs> so thank you for being the catalyst for that. Uh, Mandy, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for being a part of this. And we appreciate your explanations and also your investment in the source and, and our members so that we all use um, correct speaking and writing grammar from now on. For people who would like to learn a little bit more about you, where can they learn more? Thank you for making this so much fun. And for people who are interested in more Grammar for Grown Ups tips, they can find my weekly blog and other postings on my website, which is mandystanley.com. That's Mandy with an I. Mandy with an I, thank you.